from the historic campus of Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan, where the good, the true, and the beautiful are taught, nurtured, and honored, this is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, bringing the activity and education of the college to listeners across the country. But by and large, it is music that tells the story without words. And in the course, I try to get at what that story actually is. In the Beethoven symphonies, it is crystal clear. It is about what man does on this planet when confronted with the cruelty of fate. This is your host, Scott Bertrand, and welcome to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. Find it at podcast.hillsdale.edu. And that's Hyperion Knight, concert pianist, Hillsdale College Distinguished Fellow, and your teacher for the brand new free Hillsdale online course, The History of Classical Music. We'll preview that course and tell you a little bit about what's inside today with Hyperion Knight. Hyperion, thanks so much for joining us. It's my uh, my honor, Scott, and I'm really delighted to be able to share this with you. Let me tell people they can find pre-registration open now for the history of classical music at hillsdale.edu slash new course. Pre-registration open now, and after May 7th, it's open to everyone and live for the public at hillsdale.edu slash new course. I think we should get to know our teacher a little bit first. Hyperion, tell us when you started playing the piano, and who introduced you and helped you appreciate this music? Well, uh, that's an interesting question in my case, because even though I make my living as a professional pianist, I really think of myself as a music lover first, or perhaps a salesman for great music. My father was a very serious music lover of the old school. He'd come home from work at night, we'd put on recordings, And from the time I was four or five years old, I would simply listen to music with him in the evening. And uh, I always loved this. I started playing the piano about the same time when I was four or five. But I wasn't a prodigy or anything. I just, you know, worked at it, enjoyed it a bit. I had to be pushed a little bit to practice. Mm -hmm. But the big change came, I think, on my ninth birthday when my father got me a set of Beethoven's Nine Symphonies. He thought that'd be an appropriate gift. And uh, that night I heard Beethoven's Ninth Symphony for the first time, and there was no looking back after that. I very quickly decided this was going to be my life. In this course, The History of Classical Music, you take us through this period of time, and philosophy, science, politics, religion, even a little bit of mathematics, too. How does this all (laughs) come together to help develop what we know as classical music? Well, when I got started with the wonderful people at Hillsdale on this project, we had planned to do just four lectures or maybe six. But it was clear there was one other thing I wanted to make sure we started with. And so it rapidly expanded into eight. And so what we have now is the first four lectures going all the way from ancient Greece all the way to the end of the classical period with with Beethoven and Schubert. And then uh, in about a year, we're going to film the next four, which take us all the way from the beginning of the Romantic period into our own modern era. And part of the reason this expanded was the most interesting story in music history is the one that is never told. (laughs) It's one almost nobody knows about, but fortunately, all of our Hillsdale students will be among the elite that know all about this, Uh, which is that. From the time music was first formalized as a branch of science by Pythagoras around 600 BC, there then ensued a battle that lasted almost 2,000 years to determine the best way to tune a scale. And this is the reason why great music for us essentially begins in the late Renaissance and Baroque period. In the other arts, it goes back much further. We have great literature from ancient Greece, we have great sculptures from ancient Rome, etc., etc. But music had first to figure out exactly what a scale was supposed to be, and that took 2,000 years. It's an amazing story. And from there, the genius just exploded. Once they had everything in place, then there were musical geniuses everywhere. Mm. Hyperion Knight is with us. He is your teacher for the new Hillsdale online course, The History of Classical Music, Pythagoras through Beethoven. Find it at hillsdale.edu slash 
new course, pre-registration now and open to the public and live on May 7th. What does music allow us to say, to express, that mere words cannot? Well, that's a very interesting question because the, the whole issue of whether music is pure or whether it really does convey a real narrative, a real story, is something we all debate and we all have our own subjective feelings about. In my case, I am firmly in the camp that there is a story there, Mm -hmm. that something very profound is being conveyed in the greatest music. And I guess the difference between classical music and what we hear on the radio most of the time is that it doesn't have words for the most part. I mean, obviously, operas and and religious uh, works do have lyrics, have words in the classical music. But by and large, it is music that tells a story without words. And in the course, I try to get at what that story actually is. In the Beethoven symphonies, it is crystal clear. It is about what man does on this planet when confronted with the cruelty of fate. How does he defy fate? How does he overcome it? Mozart uh, has a very different approach. His operas are, uh, do have words and some very, very naughty characters. <laughs> and his whole message is about forgiveness. It is about mankind's fallen nature, the fact that we're all sinners. We all behave badly at one time or another, and we all have to be forgiven. So this, these very profound messages are running under the current of this music all the time, and that's what I hope the students will really take away from this course, that they're being in touch with something that's bigger than us, more profound, higher than us. I hear you talk about Beethoven and Mozart, and, and, and those are two of the, the big three, if we can say Bach, Mozart, mm-hmm. Beethoven. You spend time on each of them in the History of Classical Music course How do you differentiate between those three? What made each of their genius slightly different? Well, um, they were part of a huge uh, shift in Europe in politics, philosophy. Uh, Bach comes in in the Baroque period and the High period, along with Handel and Vivaldi, just as the whole rug is about to be pulled out from underneath the world that he lives in the world of mystical spiritualism, where God is absolutely at the center of everything that they do. And you can be sure, Bach felt completely that this was his mission, and Handel and uh, Vivaldi actually were just as as serious about this. Hmm. But then the Enlightenment comes along, and suddenly the focus shifts to humanity itself. And this is where Mozart steps in. Mozart comes in to say, well, what do we do on this planet to deal with who we are? Bach, for his own part, actually was a little suspicious of happiness on Earth, partly because it was snatched from him so many times. You know, he had two wives. The first one died. He had 20 children, only nine of whom survived. And he viewed life as more of a trial with the ultimate glory waiting in the afterlife. Mozart, on the other hand, wanted to figure out how to deal with the people around him. And Beethoven was in a completely different situation because here he was, a superstar musician, biggest man of his time in his 20s, and he goes deaf. Mm -hmm. This is fate. Now, this has nothing to do with other people. It has nothing to do with God. It has to do with a cruel twist of fate. And how do you react to that? And Beethoven reacts to it by triumphing over it. And that story is, in many ways, the greatest human story ever told. Hyperion Knight is with us on the program. We'll continue with him in just a moment as we preview for you the new Hillsdale College online course, The History of Classical Music. You can find it at hillsdale.edu slash new course. This includes four lectures, each about 30 minutes long, at a 45-minute concert performance. It is... Completely free, no charge, at hillsdale.edu slash new course. You can complete the course online, receive a certificate by watching the lectures and taking the short quizzes that follow. 
Take the course at your own pace and in a manner that best fits your schedule. But pre-register now for the upcoming release, hillsdale.edu slash new course, N-E-W-C-O-U-R-S-E, hillsdale.edu slash new course. It goes live on May 7th. We'll continue in a moment with Hyperion Night and talk more about the history of classical music. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Hyperion Night is with us. His new online course, The History of Classical Music, Pythagoras through Beethoven, is at hillsdale.edu slash new course. Throughout this time, songs are written about some of humanity's greatest achievements, victories, births, but also bad times, defeats, and deaths, and revolutions. How does this music help us to perhaps better understand what was happening during this time? Well, it it shows a real shift from a sort of humble view of man's place on the world to one where man was really trying to determine his own destiny. And through the course, of the four lectures we have in, in this first of the two series, we see that huge transition from man really kind of mystified about his place on this planet and understanding that his first duty was to God, to man starting to understand his place on the planet in the Enlightenment as modern math, modern science came about, and then having to try to sort out where that was going to take us. And as you point out, that led to revolution, because past a certain point, the people were no longer going to stand for monarchs deciding how they were going to live. And Mozart was strongly of the opinion that we needed to move away from this system, and Beethoven, of course, was a huge champion of what we would think of as our modern form of liberty. He was a champion of each individual establishing his own destiny. And this, of course, tore European, old Europe, to pieces. Um, By the time uh, Beethoven died, they had more or less come to, or let's call it a rapprochement. Europe was going to live in largely peaceful relations for almost a century until World War I. And this allowed the greatest blossoming of the arts imaginable. So what we're seeing here is something incredible, but underlying it is the fact that music itself was created in the process. Mm-hmm. The, the technology and the math finally came together right at the beginning of the Baroque period that allowed us to create great music in a way that had never been possible before. The new course, The History of Classical Music at hillsdale.edu slash new course, pre-registration right now, and then open to the public and available and live on May 7th. You can continue to sign up after that date, of course, hillsdale.edu slash new course. All right, Hyperion, for those people who are novices, who don't know much at all about this classical music, why should they take the course? What's in it for them? Well, I've always felt very strongly that the only way to get acquainted with any art form, and, and that applies to any of us, you know, for instance, myself, I had to learn about painting at some point. I still have to learn about literature. You know, there's, there's an infinite amount out there. None of us can be experts in all of it. We all need a guide. We need someone whose opinion we trust who can show us the way to what is truly great. And, and then this is the most important part. We have to cherry pick. We have mm-hmm. to find the things that are actually meaningful to us right away so that we can establish a relationship, the others will come along. I had a uh, conversation with my father when I was about uh, nine years old that I'll never forget, and I I had to confess to him that I actually didn't understand this modern composer, Bela Bartok. I didn't understand this modernist sound of his. Mm -hmm. And my father said, oh, that's really good news. I said, why? He said, because that gives you something to look forward to when you're older. (laughs) And this is absolutely true. You might love Beethoven most or Bach or Mozart, but that will all shift over time because all of it is great and you will come to appreciate it as long as you have a foot in the door, as long as you have a toehold and you can appreciate something, even if it's just the prettiest piece like Debussy's Claire de Lune, Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. that will eventually open the door to all the rest of it. And for people who have been listening to classical music for years, for perhaps decades, who do know the names you'll be mentioning throughout the course of the history of classical mm-hmm. music, why should they sign up and take the course? Well, because in addition to introducing these characters, I am actually dealing with a lot of very provocative concepts, uh, many ideas that even the most serious music lovers will not have encountered before. I'll give you one very quick example. Um, uh, We have uh, Beethoven's uh, Third Symphony, which is uh, about essentially the French Revolution was supposed to be dedicated to Napoleon. Well, Beethoven, like most of Europe, became disenchanted with Napoleon in a hurry. Mm. But what we don't talk about is that Beethoven then found a new hero, the Duke of Wellington, who would eventually defeat Napoleon. And in many ways, Beethoven's Seventh Symphony can be viewed as a sequel with a happy ending to his Third Symphony. Now, this is something most music lovers will never encounter because it's generally frowned upon in the world of serious music to look at it with such a serious, specific narrative. But I think in this case it applies, and these are one of the many ideas I'll be presenting that even, you know, serious music lovers with a long relationship with this music may never have encountered before. In Hyperion Night, the final class in this course is a performance class where we Listen and watch you play some of the music you've been talking about for the previous classes. Why was it important for you to include this entire class just to have us listen to this music? And then how do you how do you think you perhaps play these songs differently than someone else might play these songs? Very interesting question. Well, first of all, uh, this is one of the great things about the Hillsdale team was that they agreed to do this. It was not part of our initial plan. And I, I felt very strongly that since in the course I was only going to be able to provide snippets of the music, mm-hmm. that people really needed to have an opportunity to embrace the entire experience, to hear the whole course of the music itself, because ultimately classical music is partly about structure. It is formal music. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it has to have all of those parts. Um, So with this, I really wanted to give students a chance to experience the entirety of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, the entirety of a Bach fugue, uh, the entirety of Mozart's Turkish Rondo, and see how this architecture is so important in, in really understanding and appreciating the music. Um, Do I play it differently than other people? You bet. I am firmly of the camp that it is the duty of a performer to put his own personality into the music. The composer's personality is only half of the equation. Hmm. So I inject my own feelings, my own thoughts, occasionally my own notes into the works of the great composers. Hyperion Knight, concert pianist, distinguished fellow here at Hillsdale College, and your teacher for the new online course, The History of Classical Music, Pythagoras through Beethoven. Hillsdale.edu slash new course is where to sign up. Pre-registration is available now, and it goes live and available to everyone on May 7th. That's hillsdale.edu slash new course c-o-u-r-s-e hyperion knight thank you so much for joining us here on the program and we look forward to part two coming sometime soon thank you so much scott it's been a pleasure up next we talk with jeffrey a tucker founder and president of the brownstone institute about the enduring legacy of the great economist ludwig von mises i'm scott bertram this is the radio free hillsdale hour Great books, great people, and great ideas. Knowledge of these things is critical to becoming a well-educated human being. That's why I'd like to tell you about an easy and enjoyable way for you to listen and learn whenever and wherever you want. And that's through the Hillsdale Dialogues. If you haven't heard about the Dialogues, once a week, Hillsdale College President Larry Arn joins radio veteran Hugh Hewitt to discuss topics of enduring relevance, From time to time, they also talk about current events, but always with an eye toward more fundamental truths. 
and they want you to listen in, to join a conversation like no other. The Hillsdale Dialogues are posted every Friday on podcast.hillsdale.edu. That's podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you get your audio. Welcome back to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertrand. Be sure to follow us on X for show updates and guest information. We're at Hillsdale Radio. We're joined today by Jeffrey A. Tucker. He is founder and president of the Brownstone Institute at brownstone.org, author of 20 books, including Liberty or Lockdown. You find him writing daily at the Epoch Times and also on X, formerly Twitter, at Jeffrey A. Tucker. Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. We are talking here on Hillsdale's campus, and you're here for one of our CCA lecture series on great economists and talking about the relevance of von Mises today. Mm. We'll get to that, but I think we need to set the table with a bit of background on Ludwig von Mises. Could you provide us with uh, a brief bio- biographical sketch of von Mises, when he lived, and, and who he was influenced by in his thinking? I need to first thank you for the question, because it's impossible to take on a theorist as big and mighty as Mises without understanding the man and the times in which he lived. And we do this too often. Mm -hmm. We do this, we look at John Locke, and we go, oh, here's John Locke who reads books. And we go, oh, well, here's what he thought. Or or David Hume, or uh, Hobbes, uh, Marx, for that matter. But really, great intellectuals, all intellectuals, but especially these famous guys about whom we speak all the time, uh, tend to be abstracted from their own biographies. And that that is a, a tremendous error because you, you don't really understand, you can't really understand their thought unless you understand the times in which they live. And once you do, you get why it is that maybe Marx thought the way he did or why mm-hmm. Hobbes believed what he did or why, why Locke believed what he did. Um, so, you know, intellect, there's no such thing as just as intellectual history without biography and real history, too. So I would just encourage, you know, anybody who's studying anybody to to not just read the original works of the man, that's really, really important and a big step by itself, but but to to understand the context in which they're writing. So Mises, with the critical thing... it really matters in the case of Mises because he was born in what's called the Belle Epoque, you know, the eight, 1881. This was the latter quarter of the the 19th century, which in the whole history of the world is probably the most peaceful, the most prosperous, the most plentiful, the most, mm, the most confidence in human progress mm-hmm. that humanity as a whole has ever had because we were uh, now about a century into the great greatest creation of wealth uh, that the, the world has ever seen by fire by fire populations expanding income uh, the demo- democratization of wealth was was everywhere technology and it was just roaring from from electricity to to flight to you know the and the bringing of plumbing into every household and the fact that you didn't have to build fires to stay warm and you had heaters and and communications you know it, it was just a blink of an eye between the telegraph and the telephone made it all possible our cities suddenly rose up into the skies and inspired us with their majesty all these things were happening at the time he was born so what it meant was that he inherited the optimism of that period, that sort of weird confidence <laughs> that that you develop that the times of your youth are going to last forever. And a whole generation of classical liberals of his sort, or really everybody, believed that. That was fundamental. And it turned out not to be true. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, of course, the great shock of his life, yeah. you know. And so he got drafted into fighting for the old Austro-Hungarian Empire in World War One, the most calamitous catastrophe in the history of Europe, and really probably the history of the world up to that point in time. And that was a tremendous shocking reminder to him that uh, you can't count on the progress of the past to mm-hmm. continue on forever. And that evil ideas lead to evil deeds that lead to evil results. How does that knowledge affect what he does next in his life? He became 
a fighter, a fighter. You know, his first book was written in 1912, really on the cusp of, of, of the war. And it was a warning about the problems of central banks. And he said that they would lead to financial, industrial instability and inflation and subsidized government and low interest rates. Yet yeah, it was a technical book, but, and it was a correct book and it was famous throughout the whole uh, of Europe, really, because it was the best monetary treatise written up to that time. But after the war, he gets out of the war and he realizes the government's terrible. <laughs> Bad people take advantage of power. Uh, and uh, and the world is not nearly as robustly, impenetrably good as he might have believed. You know, It's fragile. Yeah. Civilization is fragile. Yeah. So, so that led to his second book, which came out in... in, um, in um, and 19, 19, right after the right after the war, same time as Keynes's economics uh, economic consequences of the piece, he wrote a book called Nation State and Economy, in which he lay, mapped out a way to deal with the decline of the old multilingual monarchies that ruled Europe for centuries and centuries, dating all the way back. Now we're in an age of democracy and self determination. How should how should we organize nations, and what should maps look like? Uh, it was a b brilliant theory about which maybe I'll speak tonight. I'm not entirely sure, but it's it's a brilliant book. But but here's what happened: it was completely ignored. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, my story is already too slow for you for this <laughs> podcast, so I'll stop there. But just to say, yeah, he he died in 1973, so he saw it all, right? He fought socialism in all of its varieties, the Soviet style or the um, National Socialism in the Nazi Germany, about which he wrote uh, uh, the most passionate anti-fascist treatise ever written in 1944, Omnipotent Government. He was uh, uh, proved to a whole generation of Viennese intellectuals that socialism could not work and, um, and mapped out. A, a, a much better understanding of the difference between the social sciences and the national sci natural sciences. I should, let me add one more point about his biography, and I promise I'll stop. He, 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 you know, after World War One, he was part of this sort of Viennese milieu of the interwar period, which was this great ingathering of intellectuals from from all places. You know, they included many people from the left and the right and everything. It was famously salon environment. He had his own mm -hmm. salon, his own circle, uh, 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 competed with other circles, but there was the intellectual engagement and peace. And there was a real attempt to rebuild the world after World War I. Well, 1934, he had to leave. He had to leave because he was Jewish and there was a Nazi movement. And then, you know, but then the, the, the invasion happened by Germany. And thank goodness he got out. He went to Geneva. He was there for six years. He wrote a masterwork, a um, thousand-page book on in economics called National Economy, and it came out in German in 1940, and it was a marketing mistake. Like the worst time to come out with a free market treatise on economics <laughs> in, 19, in German would be 1940. Yeah. And uh, so he had to come to the U.S., and, but then nine years later, he rewrote it in English, and it became the greatest work of the 20th century. And I think about this all the time, and really a bestseller by 1966. I think about this all the time because those are dark times. 1934 mm -hmm. to 1940, he's ensconced in Geneva in safe house, basically, in sanctuary, during which time he wrote and wrote and wrote over six years of sanctuary. Without that institution, without those six years, without his personal mental discipline, we would have been robbed this this mighty work. And I think about this all the time. We need a world that makes room for people to do things like that. Mm -hmm. Mises is important to us here at Hillsdale. We have a Mises room in our library on campus, his personal library, his papers are here. If you were to summarize... The core tenets of his economic thought, how would you do that? Uh, probably, well, his, the title of his book, uh, 1949, is Human Action. And it's that, that humans, you know, their choices and their volition really matters for the shaping of the world. And, and, the, and the background of that action is the ideas they hold. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that is the theme. That's the theme of all of his works, that human beings are, are not rats. They're not mo molecules. Uh, we have volition. We have rationality. We... We, we desire to live better lives. And that, that sort of innate, I don't want to use the word innate, but that, that desire that we have, all have is what shapes the world. And you cannot <clears throat> imagine political and social and economic structures independent of that uh, will 
to live a better life. The will meaning it comes from within. It's located within the individual. Uh, and those facts cannot be forgotten. Now, in saying that way on a podcast, I'm afraid listeners are going to say, oh, no kidding. Everybody knows that. Well, <laughs> it turns out not everybody knows that. Right. The people most likely to forget that are intellectuals. Mm -hmm. So that put him at odds with, with all the main intellectual trends of the 20th century. We'll be right back to continue our talk with Jeffrey A. Tucker about Ludwig von Mises. First, a very brief reminder. If you were listening earlier, you heard from Hyperion Knight, concert pianist and Hillsdale College Distinguished Fellow. He's the teacher, your teacher, for the history of classical music, the brand new free Hillsdale online course. You can sign up now, pre-register. It's open and available on May 7th. Go to hillsdale.edu slash new course, hillsdale.edu slash new course, N-E-W-C-O-U-R-S-E, and sign up for the History of Classical Music. It's free, no obligation to you. It includes four lectures, each around 30 minutes, and a 45-minute concert performance at the end. Take the course at your own pace and in a manner that best fits your schedule. But sign up now for the History of Classical Music, your new, free, Hillsdale online course at hillsdale.edu slash new course. The relevance of Mises today... I want to ask a few questions about what he might be telling us mm. or, or whispering to us in the midst of our current situation. Right. We have seen in the country the past few years high inflation, the highest in 40 plus years. He, he, Mises was a major critic of inflationary policy. What was his critique and how might it apply to our current situation? At one point when he was in Austria, at some point, people asked him, how, do we, how are we going to fix this inflation? And he took the finance minister out on the streets and went outside the, the this may be an apocryphal story, but he went outside the, the, the building of the central bank and said, you know, shut this building down and we'll fix the inflation problem. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what, what happened over, over the, over the COVID COVID period, the lockdowns is that you had, uh, uh, six, six trillion dollars created to, by government debt that was created by Congress. They never would have spent the money if they didn't, if the central bank hadn't been there to, provide the sort of moral hazard. I and mean, we've got guys over there going, hey, we, we can print all the money you need, and that incentivizes Congress to spend all those. So they, they spent trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. The central bank bought it all up and and flooded flooded the, the markets with money. The stock market started soaring. That was the first sign of inflation. I mean, inflation affects not just the mm -hmm. consumer price index, but also financials. And then and very quickly, really, within within a year after this great inflation started, we started seeing the price pressure, and it was. They all said, "Oh, it's transitory. It's transitory." It, you only had to look at the data to know that wasn't true. It was. It was a, an incredible calamity, and and the problem is that once the central bank does something like this, there's no easy way to suck the money back out. And and in fact, um, with the, all the higher interest rates and everything that we've seen, uh, the, the, the fastest and largest increases in interest rates we've seen, we still haven't sopped up all the excess liquidity. Mm -hmm. That's why we're still dealing with sticky prices, you know, and the, and the level of five, five to 6% and, and consumer price index just bouncing around all the time. In fact, we're still uh, in a period of, re of acceleration of inflation over from where, where we were for three months ago. So Mises would just scream, uh, stop, manipulating the interest rates and stop printing the money and stop buying the debt. Let's shut down the discount window. Uh, he would suggest that, you know, we put the central bank in on hiatus, just, just, just stop, stop doing the damage. <laughs> and, you know, he would say something else too, that he would go back to 2008 and say, look what you did. You tried to create a world of zero interest rates that, that led to massive industrial dis distortions. We, we blew up the big tech sector. We blew up the big media sector. We blew up all sorts of sectors into an unsustainable way. And that, that gave birth to cockamamie ideas like ESG and DEI and you know, this corruption of the, over the corporate and media and big tech sector. That's why they're all in bed with the government now. Mm -hmm. So there's all traces to this terrible policies of 2008. Now, keep in mind that after 2008, we didn't really see high inflation after that. Right. It shocked a lot of people, but it wouldn't have shocked Mises because Mises knew that, that the consequences of money printing is about more than just generating inflation. That's just a kind of a, a crude monetarist view. He saw the, a main danger of these kinds of policies as distorting the industrial structures in unsustainable ways. 
after 2008, we saw this great recession that the country experienced. In the midst of high inflation these days, there's also another worry about another recession coming. Would Mises say there's a way to avoid that? Are there are there actions to be taken to to avoid that potential catastrophe? Uh, you know, it, that's a, a a great it's a great inquiry. You know, and and we can invent sort of fantasy worlds in which the, the Washington did all the right things, mm-hmm. where we could actually avoid this. But, (laughs) you know, it's going to involve shutting down a couple of hundred government agencies, Uh, you know, and and dramatically reducing the taxes and getting serious about about the debt and restarting uh, trade relations around the world. I mean, basically, Washington has to stop doing everything that Washington does and, (laughs) and, and free up the economy. That would fix a lot of things. But, you know... It's one thing to solve problems, you know, in a in a parlor setting, you know, or on a podcast. But you know, making going going to from our world today to to getting there is is going to be a tremendous fight, and that fight starts at the intellectual level. Mm-hmm. And I and I feel like it's just begun. We're going to get a rude awakening because people are worried about a coming recession. What what happens if we don't have a soft landing? Because we never took off in the first place. Mm-hmm. You know, what if the truth is that we never really got out of recession? And I, I think the, the more I look at it, the data, the more I'm convinced that, you know, this is not just this is not just slow growth. We're not just waiting for something bad to happen. The bad thing that's happening is already here. Jeffrey A. Tucker with us. You wrote uh, something. Actually, you tweeted something. I'll paraphrase. Yeah. And that is in relation to your last comment that uh, it, it's impossible to talk about current economy, future economy without talking about COVID and, and the policies enacted. Oh, that's enacted, right. right? And, oh, that's so true. So how long will the effects of those decisions last with us mm. in the country and, and worldwide, really? Two, two, two more decades, probably. I mean, the, the, look, when they first shut down things, I thought this is insanity. We're going to get out of this thing uh, within a matter of days, and everybody's going to feel like an idiot, and everybody will apologize, <laughs> and we'll um, <laughs> restore freedom. That's my, my uh, old-fashioned optimism. So here we are three and a half years later, longer than three and a half years, and we're still dealing with it. We don't have any admissions of error. Uh, we did this calamitous uh, policies on a global level like we've never seen before, and uh, believing that you could just shut down an economy and turn it back on again. Again, and here we are with an unprecedented cultural crisis, uh, substance use problems, learning loss, uh, collapse in public health. They did also in the name of public health. You don't, you don't, you don't shut down the gyms in, you know, in the name of public health. You can't, you don't violate people's religious rights and expect them to to you know, just be fine with that. So we're dealing with an economic crisis, a cultural crisis, a political crisis, and everything crisis right now as a, as a consequence of that. And we have to talk about it. And yes, there's a reason, you know, and here's the thing. The reason we don't talk about it is because so many people were wrong. Now, that is an interesting fact to me. (laughs) You would think, you know, my naive older self might have thought if everybody's wrong, then everybody will agree to admit it and and will fix it. But actually, the opposite happens. Everyone's wrong. So everybody agrees to just shut up about it. Stop talking (laughs) about the lockdowns. Those are all over. We don't need to talk about those anymore. So that's one of the things that I never stopped doing is talking about the lockdowns. Mm-hmm. Um, since this podcast is about Mises, I do want to say something. I, I know we're tight on time and so on, but uh, Mises wrote this very interesting book in 1922 called Socialism. And so, and the demonstration was there was that socialism is literally impossible. You cannot create socialism uh, but for a variety of technical reasons, but he proved it. But he had, a, but the whole last third of the book uh, went much further, and he said, "So what happens when you have all the governments in the world, all the intellectuals in the world, all the world's smartest people agreeing to attempt something that actually turns out to be impossible? Hmm. What happens after that?" And he made an extraordinary prediction. He said. These people will not repudiate their theories. They will get mad at the world. (laughs) Mm -hmm. They'll get mad at nature. They will get mad at the way the world functions. And they will lash out and they will attempt to destroy it. How about that? How about that? Now, do you see that around us? Have you heard these people, the way they talk? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've read about the Great Reset? Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. It's what he calls destructionism. If you want to know what destructionism looks like in action, watch the movie The Joker, because that's what it is. 
It's anger. It's fury. Fury about freedom. Uh, uh, bitterness at the structure of the world that we inhabit. Uh, a desperate desire to dismantle things because they're not working the way the intellectuals wanted them to. So it's this great lashing out by the ruling class. You're seeing it all over the planet Earth. And it's exceedingly dangerous to our freedom, to our prosperity, to our rights as human beings. He wrote this in 1922. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody should reread that chapter because I, when I first read it, I thought, well, this is crazy. Well, 100 years later, we're dealing with exactly that. The destructionists have taken over I'm so sorry to report. Is that the lesson from Mises that is perhaps most applicable to us today? Or is there, is there another one? I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, let me just mention what I think is a more powerful message <coughs> of Mises. I, look, I love everything about this guy, as you can tell. Um, I will say this. Um, he was a great fighter against Hegel. And the idea that there's a meta narrative that's out of our control, that we're all along for the ride and the mm -hmm. history is just sweeping us along. It's the job of the intellectuals to nudge history in the direction of Marxism or whatever. He hated that view and really fought it his entire life. Uh, but he lived in desperate times, as we increasingly do. Uh, but he, when he was coming over on the boat from um, Geneva, to the United States, who wrote his autobiography, he was 60 years old, and he put it and he put it away and told his wife, "Don't publish this until after I'm dead." But he he writes this sentence in there that says, uh, "I started out as a reformer, but only ended up as a historian of decline." A historian of decline. Now that that is a sad remark. And when I first read that as an undergraduate, I thought, "Oh, well, that was then. It's not now." You know, we're, we're living in much better times. I'm not so sure that's true. Hmm. The battle never ends. You know, he was right at the end. But he said, he said that he swore at that moment, coming over on the boat, that, that he would never stop doing everything an economist could do to change the ideas that people hold about the world. And he quoted a statement from, um, from Virgil that goes, tu ne chedi mali se contra dentio ito, which means... Never give in to evil, but always fight against it ever more boldly. And that's what he did. He fought his whole life mm. because he believed that, I, that history is made out of the ideas that we hold and the actions that we choose. It doesn't belong to you know, Hegel's gods. It right. belongs to you and I and that we can make a difference. And he believed that, that uh, human beings can make a difference. And he believed that he could make a difference. And, you know, you could look at his life and say he didn't make as much difference as, as, as he should have, as, as he wanted to. But he can teach us now. Mm -hmm. He left these books for us. It's a beautiful legacy, a treasure, literary treasures. And all we have to do is take the time to uh, look through and let him teach us today. And he can and he will. He wants to. Jeffrey A. Tucker from the Brownstone Institute, where he is founder and president, more at brownstone.org. You can also read him writing daily in the Epoch Times and on Twitter or X at Jeffrey A. Tucker on campus to deliver a lecture, The Relevance of Von Mises Today. Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thanks for giving me a chance to talk. That will wrap up this edition of the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Our thanks to Hyperion Knight, your teacher for the brand new Hillsdale online course on the history of classical music, and Jeffrey A. Tucker, founder president of the Brownstone Institute, we talked about von Mises. The Radio Free Hillsdale Hour is recorded at the studios of WRFH, the student-run radio station at Hillsdale College. Remember, you can hear new episodes every week on this station. You also can find extended versions of some of our interviews or listen anytime to the podcast. Find it at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you get your audio. The assistant producer of the program is Sam Lair. Until next week, I'm Scott Bertram, and this has been the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Hillsdale Hour.